Wow, here we are. I'm Chris Leatham. Uh, this is another exciting episode of The Economy and You. I love that title, The Economy and You. Um, it, it basically means I can talk about anything on my show. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to this week's show. Um, my guest today is Jim Hochberg and Eva Andrade. They are from Hawaii Family Forum, used to be known as Hawaii Family Advocates, is that right? No, actually, Hawaii Family Forum is a C3 organization, Hawaii Family Advocates is our C4 organization. Oh, okay, all right, so there's the difference. Yeah. Okay, now do you have different websites for both of those? Yes, um, www.hawaiifamilyforum.org for the C3 and www.hffaction.org for Hawaii Family Advocates. Okay, well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad Thank to you be for here. coming here. Um, you know, I, I, I called you guys up and, and invited you to the show because um, we're past our legislative session and um, you know it's sort of time now to sort of evaluate what went well, what didn't go so well, where did we do well in the session and then what have we left on the table. And clearly there are some bills that are quite controversial. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the legislation because, you know, my two passions are legislation and technology because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a complete computer geek. Oh, me too. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> nice to meet you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's this joke that goes, uh, the query walks into a room and he sees two tables and says, hey, can I join you? Now, if you're a computer geek, you'll find that joke funny. And if you're not, then I'm, I apologize. That's why Jim's glazing over. <laughs> 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 Poor Jim. <laughs> but um, I'm Jim, a lawyer, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even do Facebook. Yeah, he probably uses a Mac too. So you know, <laughs> <laughs> I have both. So you have both. Okay. I have to. That way, I can be good on two things. Oh, good, because you know, it's uh, Mac users, and then there's real people, real programmers, and real, you know. No, it's the other way around. Actually, oh, right? yes, right? it is. <laughs> okay, so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, let's talk about the bill. There was a couple of things that you wanted to talk about today, and one of them had to do with this um, really exciting marijuana dispensary bill. That right, because I always wanted to own a marijuana dispensary. Yeah. No, I really didn't. You didn't? <laughs> no. Um, actually, if, if we can sort of take a step back and put into the perspective of that particular bill, any bill, uh -huh. say. So basically, in the legislature, a bill gets drafted, it gets hearings, people come and testify for it and against it, mm -hmm. it gets voted on, uh, it, it passes, it goes to the governor, and the governor can sign it, veto it, or do nothing, and it becomes law. Just it's ignore not, it and right. kind of let And it so yeah. the marijuana uh, dispensary bill currently actually is sitting on Governor Ige's desk, where he could veto it. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully he's wa he watches your show regularly. He won't miss this well, one. Well, that's what he said. I don't and, know. <laughs> and we'll convince him that he should veto the bill. And the reason that I take that position is when you, you look at the final bill, this one happens to be HB, which stands for House, House bill, bill 321. It had a House draft one, it had a Senate draft one and two, mm -hmm. and then it had a conference draft one. That's what got sent to the governor's desk. Right. Now, these sort of <coughs> conference, just for people who don't realize that, a conference bill is where you've taken the changes from both the House and the Senate and gotten together and said, okay, we've agreed on some common language. Well, what, yeah, when they don't agree with the two sides, then right. they have a conference of the both sides, a small group of each, mm -hmm. and they come up with a, you know, either they don't or they do come up with a, a compromise. But when you look at the bill, the first part of every bill, is an explanation of why we need the bill. And it's good to look there mm -hmm. to see whether they're being honest or not. And in this case, Governor Ige, they're not being honest. This wasn't your bill. This wasn't your policy. This was the previous governor's policy. You really should be to it. The, what they say in part one is the legislature finds that many, which is not a quantified term, it's about 346 people. Okay, but well, they that's say, a little bit more they'll, modified. They'll say 13,000 no, when well, they wait testify. A minute, because what they say is many of the state's nearly 13,000 qualifying patients, and that's medical marijuana patients, uh -huh. they, they, they're claiming in, in the state of Hawaii, okay, where uh -huh. marijuana has been known worldwide for 50 years as very high quality, easy to grow. Here in marijuana. Here in Hawaii. In Hawaii. What oh, the legislature, this is news to me. Oh. What the legislature, <laughs> the basis for this bill. The legislature finds many of the state's nearly 13,000 qualifying patients lack 
the ability to grow their own supply of medical marijuana. Is this because they don't understand how to cultivate marijuana properly? Well, it could be because they live in a condominium and they But have you rules. are allowed to grow six plants under the medical marijuana bill, which most Lanai's in the state of Hawaii will accommodate. Will accommodate. Okay. Although there was another bill that was going to um, stop discrimination in certain kinds of housing because that's what they were claiming is that some of their, and, and you know because you do this kind of law, that they're told they can't grow this in certain types of... But the first point that I want us to focus on okay. <laughs> is the word many. Uh -huh. Because out of the 13,000 medical marijuana card holders, there are really supposedly less than 400 who cannot, for whatever reason, they don't have a green thumb or they're disabled, mm -hmm. they cannot figure out how to make a marijuana seed become a marijuana plant. Okay. okay. Isn't there like websites and stuff that show well, you how to do this? But, but let's assume. Yes, and many let's jokes assume. about how it's called a weed. <laughs> let's, let's assume there are 400 who really just can't grow their own pot. Okay. Okay. Out of 13,000, they got to have a friend. Yes. You that could think. share. Yeah. I mean, I okay. guarantee there's some people that would be very eager to help. Now, them. it's well, illegal to give away marijuana because it is a Schedule I federally illegal drug. Right. So all we really have to do, instead of this huge bill allowing dispensaries and $50,000 uh, fees to apply and all this stuff, is just say, if you're one of those poor, less than 400 people who cannot make a seed grow into a plant, it's okay for one of your friends with a medical marijuana card to give you some of theirs. If you have a card and they have a card, share. Yeah. Okay? Well, that would be easy. That was all that but was needed. that does not, Jim, that does not generate revenue for the state of Hawaii. Which is not the reason they wanted to pass the bill. That's my entire point. If the reason for this need uh -huh. was revenue, they could have said, we need revenue. So we're going to legalize marijuana, we're going to legalize gambling, we're going to legalize prostitution, we're going to legalize speeding. So we're you're gonna, saying whatever. we're going to, we, because of the lack of intellectual integrity or honesty, we should veto this bill? Well, the, that's the first leg that it can't hold itself up with. Okay. And then you look at, okay, well, what are you creating based on a lie? It's not a medical marijuana <coughs> dispensary infrastructure. It's a legalized marijuana or a decriminalized marijuana mm -hmm. accessibility infrastructure. Yeah. That's right. what it really is. And but I, they're I, not honest about and it. And I think that the regular person who may not understand all the legalities of legalizing marijuana would understand certain things, like when this gets into the communities, how is it going to affect our families? How is it going to affect our kids? When you tell your kids not to smoke marijuana mm -hmm. or don't take drugs, but you can do it because this one's good for you. You know, then it, there's a message that becomes kind of confusing out there. So, and then you have the law enforcement who is strongly opposed to this bill. Okay, but can I play a devil's advocate with you on this? Sure. There's a <laughs> lot of families in Hawaii that smoke marijuana. I mean, it's, it's out there already. So if there are a lot of people that are already doing it, and I'm, because and I'm, I want to play devil's advocate, because I want to give you the, the opportunity to confront this. It's already happening. It's part of the culture already anyway. So is gambling. Yeah. So is speeding. You know, we're not going to increase the speed limit on the freeway. Yeah, we're going to have another talk yeah. about that one. <laughs> <laughs> we do not have an Audubon here in Hawaii. No. <laughs> and yeah, I think I, we should. Yeah. Yeah. I think social policy really should be determined by people who are statesmen rather than politicians. We don't have very many statesmen in government in the state of Hawaii, unfortunately, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. A politician will take a look at a particular proposal and de decide how they're going to support it based on what it's going to do for their next election, what it's going to do for campaign contributions, without instead saying, does this really even make sense? Well, that's a, you know, and I, one of the things that, I, you know, that I see going on here is there's this what we just saw in Colorado was that, wow, there's all this tax revenue coming about that they can use, and of course they'll talk about spending it for schools and, and for all these very niceties. But of course, at the end of the day, most of the money ends up in the general fund and gets dispersed, however the, the, the state wants to disperse it anyway. Isn't this really, I mean, at the end of the day, isn't this really about generating tax revenue? 
If you talk to the, um, the legal experts in Colorado, what they're going to tell you is that it hasn't been legal long enough for them to see how it's going to impact the economy in the future, you know, because there's going to be a lot of detriment in the community that they're going to have to need funding to take care of. So I think that you, we need to be responsible and, and look across the nation and all the nation, uh, all the nations, all the states that have legalized marijuana and uh -huh. really look at the, the financial implications because I think that on the surface it may look like it's good for the economy, but it's ultimately not going to be. And there's the, the other factor too. Do you buy things on the internet? Do you? Uh, I do. Well, yeah, yeah, and you don't I pay do. tax on it because we aren't taxed. Well, that's right. Well, if you're going to get taxed on the marijuana from the dispensary, wouldn't you rather buy it in the street behind the dispensary where you don't pay the tax? It's not going to have much to do with the black market, I don't think, just from an economics being that this is an economic show. Right. You right. know, what drives economic decisions is cost. That's true. That's true. And I think this is one of those things. This, you know, people ask me if I was support, supportive of, of uh, legalizing marijuana. And, I, and I, I know that there's been a lot of problems um, with the war on drugs. It's, you know, we have spent massive amounts of money. People are dying all over Central America uh, because of our consumption of drugs and our insatiable need for hard drugs, marijuana being one of them. Right. Okay. I do believe we do need to do something to, to mitigate that. I think we are also citizens of the world and seeing people die over our insatiable uh, desire to use illicit drugs is a problem. Um, I also see that um, what we have been doing hasn't worked in terms of, of we've been fighting this fight for a long time. We haven't won. In fact, the argument is we've lost the war on drugs. Um, so where do we go? What, what, what can we be doing? What should we be doing um, going forward to mitigate the damage done by our consumption of drugs? Well, let's look at the way uh, the liberal politicians address cigarette smoking with young people. Mm -hmm. they, they pretty much tell them don't ever start right. cigarette smoking right. because it, you may get lung cancer when you're older and you may die from it. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the other hand, they tell kids you can get an abortion, it doesn't matter. Even though we know there are psychological impacts almost immediately upon uh, mm -hmm. young people having abortions to uh, yes. eliminate children. Um, so uh, I think of those two examples, and I, I don't know how the same policy makers can be so inconsistent. Well, there's so many inconsistencies in the law. And, you know, when you look at Hawaii law, I mean, we have consistencies all, inconsistencies all over the place. Uh, it, does, it, does it, do we need to, uh, in my opinion is, what we need to be doing is we need to be strengthening families. Right. We need to be developing legislation that respects the unique and important role that both parents play and building opportunities to strengthen families and the ability for parents to lead within their own family. Too often we have families have sort of abdicated their responsibilities and the state is all too quick to step in and play parent or tell you that you're not necessary, you're not relevant, instead of working toward doing things that help families get stronger, especially young families, you know, we sort of refer to these as brittle family units. Um, and they're very susceptible to being exploited. They're, you know, they have a lot of financial difficulties, especially here in Hawaii, where the cost of living and the, there's the huge disparity between the cost of living and wages. Um, and so, um, to me, it seems like if we're going to build policies, the policies that we build should be about about encouraging and strengthening families and giving families more resources to keep their families growing in the proper direction. You this doesn't seem to help with that. This doesn't seem to help that agenda. No. It, it really doesn't, and I think that you've done a really good job of encapsulating what's really happening at the legislature, because if you look at several problematic bills, and we'll talk about some of them a little later, we're talking about the legislature stepping up to say these parents and these families are falling apart, so the government has to step in to protect them with safe places and right. early childhood education right. and, and these sort of, of things. So I, I do think that you've made a good point to say that parents need to start taking the responsibility. Here. But there's a middle ground too, because the legislature isn't strengthening the parents to do their job. They're separating the kids from the parents. Yes. And the policies. Yes. Well, on that note, we're going to go to commercial. Um, this very serious talk started off very fun, very, very interesting, and it keeps going interesting, but it's gotten kind of serious. And we're going to go to commercial. We'll be right back 
I want to talk a little bit more about this, and I also want to talk about the Safe Places Bill. Uh, I'm Chris Leatham. This is The Economy and You, and we'll be right back. Aloha. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. <laughs> Are you surprised? Okay, and we, and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. <laughs> Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes, there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public, and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because, as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So uh, come join us. And if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll, we'll put you up here and, uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be, from Think Tank's point of view, it's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our, it's our most important <laughs> show. So come around and listen to us 4 to 5 on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Two, one, and we're back. Hi, I'm Chris Letha. This is The Economy and You. Uh, today's guest is Jim Hochberg and Eva Andrade uh, from Hawaii Family Forums and Hawaii Family Advocates. Advocates. Um, and so we're talking a little bit, a little bit about the mar um, marijuana dispensary bill. And you brought up an interesting thing while we were on break, uh, talking about how sort of the, 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 the political gyrations that go on that actually has allowed this bill to move into, uh, to end up on the governor's desk. And can you touch on that just a little bit? Yeah, um, a lot of people don't understand that in order for a legislator to be on a conference committee, they have to support the bill from the get-go. So if you vote no on the bill, then you don't have an opportunity to be on the conference committee. So when this particular bill moved to conference committee, uh -huh. um, there was a strong disagreement at the end between um, Senator Josh Green and Representative Della Albalati. Josh Green being a physician. Being a physician. Della being a lawyer. And they were bo they're both chairs of the respective health committees in both mm -hmm. the, the House and the Senate. And all the way up until the last minute, um, Senator Green was very concerned very concerned about certain provisions in this bill and when he was gonna not vote to pass the bill there was suddenly this big move and he was stripped of his position and Willie S. Farrell was put in his position and the bill was was passed and this was after the deadline by the way interesting after yes. the deadline after the deadline now the deadline meaning no more bills 6 no, we're PM. done yes. 6 p.m. it's the drop dead time that conferences need to come and up with their decisions right. on the we're, bill. Done, we're, we're done we're done except in this case except we weren't quite case. done and that's yes. another reason yes. that's really another reason mm -hmm. uh, to go along with the fact that the reason for the bill is not honest the purpose for the bill wasn't honest <laughs> the way they accomplished <coughs> getting it passed wasn't honest mm -hmm. uh, governor Ige this was not his policy, this was Governor Abercrombie's policy to start with, he can, he should veto the marijuana mm -hmm. dispensary bill. We don't need it. It's totally unnecessary. Well, you made, a, you made a really good argument for this bill, so we'll see, let's see what happens. Anything else you want to add before we go? I think we, I wanted to touch a little bit about the safe places. Anything else you want to add? Uh, it's good for me. Okay. good for me. Okay, so um, your, your position is that this bill should be vetoed. And should people let the governor know? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. They should call the governor and they should say, you've got to veto this bill. It's just not what we want for Hawaii. And, and we don't need it. If, if 346 medical marijuana cardholders can't make a seed become mm -hmm. a plant and smoke mm -hmm. it, 
they got to have a friend out of the 13,000 well, that can share with them. We can always post something on Facebook, and I'm sure there are people that would volunteer. <laughs> I don't do Facebook. <laughs> Here's Zuri the back laughing. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the safe places. This is another controversial bill. I know I had Senator Chen Oakland on the show a couple weeks ago, and we talked about this. And she just thought this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, let's let's be honest. There are 41 states that have a safe places or some form of a safe places bill passed. Mm -hmm. And um, when it originated, it was because people were concerned about these lock key kids, you know, these kids that um, needed services and they needed help because they were growing up in situations where they didn't have the best parents. So the idea behind the safe places was to protect these kind of kids. Well, I was a latch key kid. Well, but the, and the way it works is the yeah. businesses in the community can volunteer to be a quote unquote safe place where the young person can go and there's like a sign in the window to identify that room as a safe is, place. Is this like the you see on the um, on the trucks, the the electrical vehicle trucks or the telephone vehicle trucks that says I'm like, you know, if you're a kid in trouble, just maybe something like that. I don't know if that's help. exactly. I'll just let me know. Of, I'll help you. And but but the idea is that there are these businesses and these nonprofit places right. where the young minor can go, and then once there, it's a quote unquote safe place, which I guess means if their parent comes to get them, they don't have to go. I don't know what that safe place thing actually means. Well, that seems to be part of the controversy. The child doesn't have to go, or the, the parent has to go to the court and get some sort of documentation. The child doesn't want to now, leave. Well, the family the court system has always taken care of these quote unquote guardianship issues through the court system. Mm -hmm. So if, if the idea with the safe places theory is to eliminate the guardianship that's very bad for families and very bad for parents. Well, I think um, Duke Iona, who is the current um, interim executive director for Hawaii Family Advocates, he testified on the current version of the Safe Places Bill. And his concern was that when a child is in a situation where they need to go and find services, mm -hmm. it was a volunteer who would discern if this child was really in danger, and if it was, then they need to be removed from the household. Now, this yeah. is a volunteer, so right. what kind of training do they have? You see, you're kind of removing the protections of, of a court system or the police department to make sure that there's really Well, there's, there's a fundamental principle called parens pari. It's Latin, okay? And um, being a, a lawyer, um, basically it means that th there is sort of some sort of value in the structure of the family, and you should pierce the family unless you have good cause. In other words, the family unit is, is a structure that should have integrity. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Senator Chen in Oakland's point was there are kids that are getting kicked out of their homes because they're gay, because they're transgender, the families are Catholic, don't necessarily want the kid at home. In that situation, is that really what safe place is being utilized for? Or is it being utilized for kids who are doing things that they shouldn't be doing and know if I go home, I'm going to get punished, and if I stay here, I can avoid punishment? You know what would make a really neat study? is to take a bill that's this kind of a bill and read the testimony from the same supporting organizations over the historical sessions that the bill was considered and watch how their arguments change over time as they think of new reasons mm -hmm. and they you know jockey for a better result kind of a thing mm -hmm. i don't know um, I have no factual data whatsoever on what the, uh, the number of kids that really need this. I don't know what mm -hmm. the number of kids need it for one reason versus another. Uh, but I, I do think that spending tax money to separate children from their parents by having safe places, mm -hmm. by having anything else you want to call it, right. is the wrong perspective. If the government's going to spend money to solve that problem, they ought to spend the money helping the parents learn how to do a better job. You know, parenting, and here's the thing, Jim and Eva, for the first time in, in the history of humanity, we have all these res resources available to us at our fingertips. And thank God for the Internet. In, in some respects, I mean, the Internet is a, boom, is, is, is a godsend in the sense that if you want to learn how to be a better parent, if you want to access information on, on um, how to solve certain issues that you might be having as a parent or challenges, there's forums out there. There are massive resources available to you free online today that if you're a parent and you're trying to figure out how to, because I tell you what, I raised two daughters and 
they drove me out of my mind. There were days I could, didn't know if I was going to survive. And you know, it was, and it wasn't that my, my daughters were particularly bad. They were just testing the water. They're doing what teenagers do. And it's all do. teenagers do. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, sometimes you're, as a parent, you're at your wit's end. You know? And I had a daughter that was suffering from, suffering from borderline personality disorder. She was cutting herself. And I know that I went to the court to try to get help. Um, and I was flabbergasted by the lack of, of concern from the courts and the idea that, well, you know, she's, the mom's helping her a little bit, so she's probably going to be okay. And yet I'm watching her slip further and further. And in, 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 for, in my case, it wasn't until I got my daughter in college that I was able to get her the kind of help she needed. I mean, I had to get her out of the state of Hawaii mm -hmm. to go get her the help that she needed. Uh, you know, but of course, then I, you know, th there was a whole series of issues that, that came with that problem, and so um, I can see where we what we really need to be doing is quit using this adversarial model of our court system, and really start to develop structures that are supportive, uh, and build structures that are supportive of parents and need to be better parents. But I don't see that happening. I don't see us building those kinds of structures. I mean, the churches are great. The churches help. We have those organizations out there that will provide some assistance. But you know, these are people doing the best. Like they're volunteers. But I don't really see them. That they're not always trained. Right. You right. know, and sometimes they come from a very sort of religious perspective, which may not always be appropriate. And I think you made the point earlier, you know, where is that delineation between the kids that really need the help and those that just might get mad because their parents are a little too strict for them? Mm -hmm. the, the particular Safe Places bill we're talking about didn't have very clear um, delineation between the two, and that's, th therein is the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist often. Every once in a while, there's a good one. <laughs> but I think... I think there's an, uh, an element in our state government that thinks parents, generally speaking, aren't very good parents. And I don't know that that's accurate. I think, generally speaking, parents probably are okay. It's a learning process. I mean, parenting is something you do by, you know, you learn by doing. Correct. Um, and of course, if there are resources that, that help you, I mean, you're learning how to apply good parenting skills. I took parenting classes. I took them a couple of times. Because, you know, I didn't necessarily grow up with the best parenting in the world. Um, and so I really wanted to do well by my children. And then it depends on whose classes you take. Right. You know. what, what, what theory are you learning and applying? You know? I, yeah. think, I think each of us as parents, we need to, we need to be very um, mindful of what our kids are going through. And I think at, when, at the hearing when they were testifying to these parents kicking their kids out because they're you know, identifying LGBT, that's, mm -hmm. that's horrifying if you, if you think mm -hmm. about it. Um, in the Christian community, many of the workshops we do, parents are not saying they're kicking their kids out. So I would really like to see more detailed um, analysis of these studies. Yeah, I think, I think data will, will win out here if we have more data by which we can make intelligent choices. Because, you know, one also has to consider the unintended consequences of, of these types of things. You know, when I was a kid, we had boys clubs and girls clubs. Mm -hmm. oh, we, had, uh, we had the YMCA. We had places that we could go as a kid, you know, if we, to keep out of trouble. And we had people around us that would scold us if we started misbehaving or doing something we shouldn't be doing. And in my neighborhood, you know, if, uh, if the neighbor saw us doing something we we're supposed to be doing, the neighbor didn't have a problem taking a shoe the to our behind coconut either. wireless. <laughs> <laughs> Here in Hawaii, your parents find out about you being naughty even before you get home. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right, right, yeah. And I think we've lost a lot of that, so that civility and that support and that sort of uh, back and forth, you know. And teachers, you know, when I got paddled by a teacher in school for you not turning home. You get paddled at home, home, too. When I got <laughs> home, yeah, I got it again. It wasn't, they were like, yeah, we know how you are, Chris. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the community beatings will begin. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, anyway, we're going to go to commercial. We'll be right back. Uh, this has been a great discussion. <laughs> I'm Chris Leatham. This is the Economy and You, and stay, and stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. 
that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Wow, our final segment already. Um, I'm Chris Lisa. This is Economy and You. Our guest today is Jim, James Holtberg and Eva Andrade uh, from Hawaii Family Forum and Hawaii Family Advocates. Now, we um, have to say I'm not from Hawaii Family Advocates. I used to be used the president be. of Hawaii be. Family Advocates. I'm not. I haven't been since the beginning of 2015. Oh, okay. Uh, but I am still a civil rights attorney, and I still support the two organizations. But I don't want to make it sound oh, like okay. I'm here right. on behalf of... Uh, uh, okay, all right, very good. Um, but you, you were, like you said, you were the president Correct. before, though. Yeah. And as a civil rights attorney, these issues are still top of mind for you. Absolutely. Okay, all right. Everything we talked about okay. is still equally as valid. It so, was it all, it still is. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about the gender issue, you know. Um, I have a, a friend of mine who's changed his ID from male to female. Uh, he's been a family friend for a very long time. Although the, the wig thing, you know, I'm still getting adjusted to that. But uh, the interesting thing was that he could change his ID. Now, how has that come about? Well, of course, because of the whole situation with Bruce Jenner, everybody's talking about this changing. His name isn't Bruce, I think. Yes. Bruce Brucey? Or no, no, no. Actually, he's on the or she's on the front page Caitlin. of yes, Caitlin. 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 Yes. It's Jennifer. still a heat though, because yes. there was no Call surgery. Call me Caitlin. No surgery. <laughs> yes. No surgery. No surgery. But um, I think he is going through the process, though. But um, you asked how, what is happening here in Hawaii. Well, here in Hawaii, we just passed a bill that will allow someone who identifies a different gender to change their birth certificate without the operation. So You've been able to change your birth certificate for some period of time, but okay. it would say there was a change. Yes, there'd be an amendment. Now, it just says nothing. It's just who you are as if it were true that you were born. And there's that way. no age limitations on it. So some of the testimony was, could a parent then go in and change their birth certificate of their child? And the answer oh, was yes, they could. Wow. And, it, and, and the other question that was asked during the, the process, which is a really good question, if you can change your birth certificate based on what you identify, how about do I, if I identify as a Native Hawaiian, could mm -hmm. I then change my birth certificate to say Native Hawaiian? Because identification, if you're looking at what the law says, it means one thing uh -huh. or both. So. so then I can identify myself as being Japanese? Mm -hmm. Can well, I identify Asian? myself as being extremely wealthy? Yeah, well, like, that's good luck on, on that one. <laughs> There's no dollar sign on the birth certificate. But the answer the legislature said uh -huh. was no. You cannot identify a different race, but you can identify and a different race. And you know what's gender. really interesting? Both your race and your gender are scientifically based. Yeah. Because DNA is DNA. Well, now what do you is do? DNA. What do you do so with all the kids? Well, so why can your DNA for gender purposes not be scientific anymore? Mm -hmm. It's now psychological. Uh huh. But for race purposes, nope, it's scientific. Well, that's interesting because as I was saying, you know, I have daughters that are half Chinese. So the question is, well, do you feel like you're more Chinese or do you feel like you're more Haole or Caucasian? Because you're mixed. And then you've got kids that are Polynesian, Caucasian. They've got some American Indian in them. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, what do you do? When you, do you just go all the above? You just like, you know, is it a check I always box? check other just for fun. Just other. Well, it's an it's inter interesting question because I have, I call myself a Heinz 57. I have many, many different ethnicities. Um, I'm half Portuguese, so that takes over most of what I have. But actually, I do identify most closely with the Native American that I have. So does that mean I get to change my birth certificate then and, and identify myself? See, it's, that's the question, right? Because clearly, if you can change your gender, but you're not just being able to change your, 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 how you identify yourself racially should be a small step. Not according to this legislation. Uh -huh. okay. so. See, this goes to the arbitrary nature, nature of legislation. And that's a great segue into the uh, early childhood education. Yes, there we so, go. That's right. <laughs> so this, is a, this amazes me that okay. our government is this bold to do this thing this way and not care. Okay? So what happened is we woke up one day a couple of years ago, uh -huh. 2013, 
and it was it was before the end of July, and we said, oh my goodness, or this is 2012, oh my goodness, we have a whole bunch of four and a halfs that aren't going to be five before July 31st, so they can't go to kindergarten. We have to amend our Constitution uh -huh. so that we can take care of this early childhood education, huge millions of kid problem. It was a surprise, but it shouldn't have been a surprise. Wait a minute, because wait a minute. It takes a constitutional, let, let me get this right, because this, this bothers it, it me. It did. It takes a constitutional amendment? No, I, I'll explain it. Okay, because go ahead. Because this yes, just bothers so, me. In 1959, when the Constitution was created for the state of Hawaii to become a state, it had a provision in it that said no public funds can be used for private education. That phrase is called the Blaine Amendment, goes all the way back to the Civil War time. Many states have Blaine Amendments. Every state that became a member of the Union after this Blaine Amendment thing failed in Congress, uh -huh. they all had to have it. And basically, Originally, it was an attack on parochial education. Okay. There was Especially an issue. Those Catholic. Ca Catholic schools <laughs> were the, were the non-public schools. Well, we know there's lots of horror stories about Catholic schools. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are none, you know. But anyway, so we had that provision in our constitution yes. in 2012, and in order to spend public funds on early childhood education. It was going to have to be given to private schools because the DOE starts at kindergarten. Right. It used to start at pre-kindergarten. I did. Until 2012, oh. when they passed Act 178. 178 took away the pre-kindergarten. It also moved the date you had to turn five in uh -huh. order to start kindergarten in August. It used to be you had to be five by December 31st. Okay. Act 178 moved it to. July 31st. So the state of Hawaii created this problem in 2012. This boggles my mind. Well, that's why I wanted to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, why? So, well, I, I go back to one of the very few uh, conspiracy theories that I think might be true, and that is the desire to separate our families from our children at the early and earlier ages so mm -hmm. that they can be indoctrinated by other than the values that the families hold. You get a more homogenous society when individual families are not like, inculco inculcating values. Right, because we see this in Japan. I mean, yeah. Japan is so, very early. So what happened is, it was very interesting. In 2012, they rearranged the deck of cards so that they created four-and-a-half-year-olds in 2013 that couldn't go to kindergarten in the public schools. Mm -hmm. And at the same time that they put forth the constitutional amendment to say you can't use public funds for private education except early childhood education, and except as long as all the other constitutional restrictions are applicable, mm -hmm. uh, which, which is means another no story, religion. which is another story. Um, at the same time, they gave us that to vote for. Yes. They had a bill to put 20 million, oh, that's your mom, take the call. No, no. Uh, they had. It's the governor they, they were, saying, please don't the governor, talk about please don't. It's early childhood yes. education. There was another bill, and this again <laughs> wasn't Governor Ige. This was Governor Abercrombie's gig with President Obama's DOE. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so at the same time they give us this constitutional amendment to allow the public funds to be used for these four and a half year olds, there was a bill to fund it, $20 million. And when the Finance Committee in the House heard, it was one of the most interesting hearings I've ever been to Is in the right? legislature. <laughs> so the governor's there, David Louie, my friend who was the Attorney General, was there. Representing the governor. Representing the governor. Right. They're, they're talking about the bill and... and um, he really does not want us to Re discuss it. Representative this. Luke um, <laughs> was asking the DOE experts, well, you know, really just kind of basic common sense questions. Okay, so you got four and a half year olds now that you want to pay for school. Do you have transportation in this bill? How uh -huh. are they going to get there? Oh, well, we never thought about that. Just all kinds of stuff like that. One of the big problems that our two organizations had was the second clause that said as long as all the other constitutional restrictions apply mm -hmm. basically meant, and the governor's website made it very clear, and meetings that you had made it very clear, religious preschools didn't qualify for the money unless essentially they became non-religious in that sector. Really? And we're talking very sterile. 
no crosses on the wall, no veggie tales videos. On no the grace line. before meals. No grace before meals. And so, for instance, can we do like even a itadakimas? You know, the Japanese do itadakimas. You know, is this like you can't? <laughs> is that religious? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess it depends on how you feel about it. Okay. Well, then if. If somebody finds it offensive, there'll be a lawsuit. So, <laughs> so we are, we're at this hearing, and we're, we're testifying, and um, so I'm trying to explain that the governor's website made it really clear that religious preschools weren't going to get to participate, which meant the state of Hawaii was purporting on economic grounds mm -hmm. to interfere in the preschool market by subsidizing the non-religious schools, which could have the effect in the end of running the religious schools out of business. Hmm. And so Representative Luke asked the governor if that was true. David Louis stood up to answer. And why don't you tell him what the and governor said? And then the said. governor said, I don't want him answering any of these questions. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> that, I had never seen that in my life. Yeah, I've been so, a lawyer for Wait a minute. The, the guy that was sent over here to represent me. No, no, wait a minute. I don't want you talking now. Yeah, and David Louie was like six feet tall. He stood up to speak. Mm -hmm. Governor Abercrombie at about up four seven seat. jumped up <laughs> and, and was trying to push him down so he couldn't speak. It was crazy. It was really crazy. So what ended up happening is the, the legislature killed that proposal. Mm -hmm. When we voted, we killed the proposal at the election, so the Constitution didn't get amended. Okay. But there was another voucher that's a word the DOE does not like they do not like the voucher the, department of, human, the department of human services yes. had a preschool voucher for impoverished immigrants who needed preschool care uh -huh. for their children so they could work and it was a voucher to the family uh -huh. they could select the school they wanted there was no constitutional crisis involved in a parent using state money and picking a religious school so the 20 million dollars went into there for the interim waiting to see uh -huh. if the Constitution would be amended. It wasn't. It wasn't. And so now that's, that's what they have left. So now we have vouchers. For the preschool. For preschool. You know, this could lead to more interesting things down the road. If the voucher program is successful, we might find it, hey, we may like this and use it other places. Well, but see, once you're five, you don't qualify. Well, yeah, but well, you, yeah, and many, you start off with five-year-olds and then maybe extend it to six-year-olds. Well, actually, and, many of the legislators dur on their floor speeches made it really clear they do not support vouchers. And the uh, HSTA so, was yeah. on our side opposing both the constitutional amendment and the bill funding the You money. know, that just goes to show you politics make strange bedfellows. They really do, <laughs> which is why you never, ever, ever make enemies of anybody. Because you right. never know when they're going to be on the same side. You never know when you might side. meet a friend. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, thank you, folks, for being on the show today. <laughs> it was a very interesting show. <laughs> well, we're almost out of time. Um, any last words before we take off? Governor, veto the medical mar the marijuana dispensary bill. Okay, excellent. Anything and, else from yeah, you? Yeah, people in the community, you've got to raise your voice and be heard. Um, they speak. They work for you. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Chris Letha. This is The Economy and You. Thank you for watching today's show, and uh, we'll be back again next week, Wednesday, 3 o'clock. Hope you'll stay, stay and uh, watch the show again next week. Thank you.